Last week, we looked at this prophecy in the minor prophet Nahum, and we learned something about God's judgment. We learned that for those who have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, that God's judgment now should give us both a both-and side of things. We, we should both understand the fear of falling under God's judgment, the fear of understanding that my sin made me fully liable to God's punishment. But then we also know the comfort on the other side of having our sins forgiven and being in a right relationship with God through the work that Jesus did on the cross. And so now we understand the comfort even more so because we understand the judgment that could have been ours. We also understand as Christians the both and of the remorse when I, um, when I blow it, when I say something, when I do something that is contrary to God's word, contrary to his nature, I understand the remorse of that, but I also understand the immediate relief that comes from my confessing that sin, repenting of it, asking forgiveness, and as we saw in a previous minor prophet, that uh, Micah tells us that, that our sins are trampled underneath God's feet and thrown into the depths of the ocean, never to be brought up again. And so we can understand the both and side of that, both the fear of judgment and the comfort of forgiveness, both the remorse of our sin and the relief that that sin can be immediately forgiven and forgotten. But for those people who don't have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, they don't see the both and. They only know the fear and the remorse. They can't see the other side of it yet. Now, I asked a question last week as we looked at this prophet Nahum. I asked, how are we supposed to respond when we read a prophecy like this that is foretelling the doom of the Assyrians, the utter destruction of this Uh, at the time, most powerful nation on the earth. What is our response supposed to be? But I didn't answer the question from Nahum's perspective. What was his response to foretelling this judgment? I think that we see it right in the opening words. I read it here for you for a second out of the uh, New International Version. It says, an oracle concerning Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum the Elkishite, an oracle. In other words, God showed this to me, and I've seen it. Now I'm telling you about it. But let me read the same verse for you out of the New King James Version. I want you to hear this. The burden against Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum the Elkishite, the burden Now, that Hebrew word is almost always associated with hearing God's word and knowing how weighty it is. In fact, throughout the scripture, the presence of God, the appearance of God is is frequently described in terms of its weightiness, its heaviness, that, that when God shows up, when he reveals himself, how completely awesome it is, how it leaves people in awe, how people sometimes just literally in their physical body collapse onto the ground because of the weightiness of being in God's presence. And that's what Nahum is really saying here. He, when, it, when he says an oracle concerning Nineveh, a, the burden of this, he said, boy, to get this message, to share with this nation that their doom is coming, This is a heavy, heavy thing. It is a burden to hear this thing. Now, when we think of prophets or we think of that word prophecy, a lot of times what we think of is somebody foretelling events that are coming in the future. And that is part of it. Part of it is foretelling future events. But the other part of prophecy is this, and you'll, you'll see the phrase frequently throughout both the major and the minor prophets, you'll see this phrase, thus says the Lord. This is what God says. And what prophets frequently do is tell us not future events, but present tense. They will say, this is God's standard, and friends, we are falling short of it. And so then they can also foretell, they can say, if we don't measure up to God's standard, if we don't do what God has told us in his word to do, 
then we can be assured, we can foretell that there will be punishment that is coming as a result of our not living up to the righteous standard that God gives us. Let me quote for you again from my cousin, Dick Brogdon. Listen to these words about prophets. He said this, The prophets foretell, that is, speak to what will happen in the future, and they forthtell, that is, speak to what we should be doing in the present. They do both of these things in the light of God's heart for his own glory among all the peoples of the world. When God speaks, we need to pay attention. God never makes empty threats. He never just saber rattles. They're not idle threats. They're not just saying, hey, this is what's going to happen, but he really has no intention of following through on that. And on the same side, God's blessings are never empty words either. When he says, this is the blessing for receiving the forgiveness that I have. This is the blessing for living up to this righteous standard. Those are not empty promises or empty boasts either. Listen to what uh, the what King Solomon said about God's words. He said this, with your mouth you have promised and with your hand you have fulfilled it. So he said when when God says something, he not only says it, but he completes it as well. That is on both sides, both the judgment for sin and the blessing for forgiveness and being in a right place with him. Neither one of those are empty words. So in this prophecy in Nahum, I want you to hear the completeness, the the weightiness of what Nahum is foretelling about this nation of Nineveh. I want to start with the last verse of chapter 2 of Nahum, but we're going to go through the first seven verses of chapter 3 as well. It just flows right here in one thought. So this is God speaking. He says, I am against you, declares the Lord Almighty. I will burn up your chariots in smoke, and the sword will devour your young lions. I will leave you no prey on the earth, The voices of your messengers will be heard no longer. And now listen to this kind of rapid fire statement that that Nahum starts listing off of what's going to happen to the people of Nineveh. That's the, the capital city of Assyria. Woe to this city of blood, full of lies, full of plunder, never without victims, the crack of whips, the clatter of wheels, galloping horses and jolting chariots, Charging cavalry, flashing swords, and glittering spears. Many casualties, listen to this, piles of dead, bodies without number, people stumbling over the corpses. That's what's going to happen. Why? He explains. All because of the wanton lust of a harlot, alluring the mistress of sorceries, who enslaved nations by her prostitution and peoples by her witchcraft. I am against you, declares the Lord Almighty. I will lift your skirts over your face. I will show the nations your nakedness and the kingdoms your shame. I will pelt you with filth. I will treat you with contempt and make you a spectacle. All who see you will flee from you and say, Nineveh is in ruins. Who will mourn for her? Where can I find anyone to comfort you? Twice God says, I am against you. Now listen, he's not against people. He loves people. He's not against them. What is he against? He explains there, starting in chapter in verse number four of chapter three, it's all because of the wanton lust of a harlot, alluring the mistress of sorceries who's enslaved by prostitution. It's the spirit of evilness, the spirit of lies and deception that have so blinded and enmeshed people. Now, listen, they did understand this before. A hundred years before Nahum wrote this, we already looked at Jonah. He went and preached almost a similar message. God's judgment is coming. And the people of Nineveh repented. They recognized their sin and, and they repented before God of their sins. Sadly, 
It didn't stick. They slipped away and, and gave back into this spirit of this prostitute that was pulling them away. And so God says twice, I am against you. I'm against you. When this judgment falls, did, did you hear God's question here? Where can I find anyone to comfort you? Where's comfort going to come from? Because listen to how Nahum closes his just short three chapters. Listen to what he says in these last two verses of chapter three. O king of Assyria, your shepherds slumber, your nobles lie down to rest, your people are scattered on the mountains with no one to gather them. Nothing can heal your wound. Your injury is fatal. Now listen to this. Everyone who hears the news about you claps his hands at your fall. For who has not felt your endless cruelty? What is it about the human nature that when bad guys get justice that we applaud for that? Now, I've, I've asked the question a couple of times. How are we to respond when God foretells judgment and when that judgment actually falls? How are we to respond? We see Nahum's response. It's a burden. This is heavy. This is an awesome, weighty task that God has laid on me to share these words. But let me look at it from this perspective. How does God respond? How does he feel about this? Well, listen to what he says to the prophet Ezekiel. Do I take any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the sovereign Lord? Rather, am I not pleased when they turn from their ways and live? You see, God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. He has no pleasure in his judgment falling. That's not where he finds pleasure. He finds pleasure when people repent, when they turn from those ways. Listen to how much God wants us to turn. It's probably the best known verse in the Bible, I would say. Jesus said these words in John 3.16, Listen, he said, for God so loved the world. Listen to those words, for God so loved the world. Not God was so frustrated with the world, he had it up to here with him, and lightning and judgment and total devastation comes. No, that's not the response. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. God so loved people who had sinned and fallen away from him and were liable, God would be completely justified in his judgment and his punishment falling on them. But instead of his punishment and his justice being poured out on them, he so loved them that he gave his one and only son. He created the way out. He created the forgiveness for sins. He, for, he created the way for them to, for you and I to experience not the fear of judgment, but the comfort, the relief, the joy of forgiveness. God gave his one and only son that whoever would believe in him would not perish, would not suffer the judgment, but would have eternal life, would, would be able to experience the blessing, the joy of being in God's presence. Now, that, as I said, I think is one of the best-known verses of, in the Bible. But we often stop right there, but I think verse 17 of John chapter 3 needs to be always quoted right on the heels. Listen to what Jesus said. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but, but to save the world through him. Friends, listen, the Bible makes it abundantly clear that when you and I sin, God's first response is not anger, but brokenhearted grief. Right from the very first sin, when Adam and Eve sinned, when God shows up, he says, Adam, Eve, where are you? Where are you? Why are you hiding from me? Why are you running away? I want you to be close to me. So, 
Friends, let's guard our hearts. When, when we hear a foretelling of judgment, or even if we see judgment poured out somewhere on somebody that we think is guilty and evil and deserving of that punishment, let us not be like these people in the closing verses of Nahum that, that clap our hands at that. But let us experience what God experiences. It's not his desire that any should perish but that all should come to know him. Let's respond with the same broken-hearted grief. Let's respond as Nahum did, realizing there's a burden on us to be able to foretell and forth-tell to people. Now, I realize how you might respond, and it's, it's something I struggle with as well. You, you might say, but what can I do? I'm just one person. I, I, I'm, I'm not a... I'm not a Billy Graham. I'm not a worldwide evangelist. So some of you watching this might even say, you know what? I'm not even a pastor like you. So what, what am I, what I going to do about this? I'm just me. I just have a small circle of friends. I just have a little spot. How am I going to make a difference? Well, listen to what God said through the prophet Jeremiah. Go up and down the streets of Jerusalem. Look around and consider. Search through our squares. Listen to this. If you can find but one, just one person who deals honestly and seeks the truth, I will forgive this city. You, you might say, oh, it's just me. I, I'm, just, I'm just one person. What, what am I going to do? Hey, just you? living God's way, you already are creating the opportunity for God to bring forgiveness because your light is already shining in that community where you are. Just one person can make a difference. Now, here's, here's what else we can do. This is, I quoted from Ezekiel earlier when, when God was explaining his brokenhearted response. It's, he doesn't find pleasure in the judgment of the wicked, but he finds pleasure when, peop, when the wicked turn. But as he talked to Ezekiel, he said, Ezekiel, I am giving you a position. I'm giving you a responsibility. And it's a responsibility that, friends, both you and I can take on. Listen to what he says here in Ezekiel 3.17. Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Now, what does that mean? A watchman, somebody who is looking out to see what's coming and then letting the people know what's coming. That sounds a lot like that quote we read earlier, right? Both foretelling what's coming and forthtelling what we need to do to avoid the judgment that is coming. Well, where do we get that? Then the, the word that we're supposed to share, God says, we're going, he's going to give it to us. He says, so hear the word I speak, and give them warning from me. So we, we don't have to come up with something. We just have to listen to what God already says. And then we just say it. We forth tell it. We speak it out. But listen to, to what God says about the weighty responsibility that he's given us. So this, is, again, is God speaking. When I say to a wicked man, you will surely die— you're, I'm foretelling the judgment coming. And you do not warn him or speak out to dissuade him from his evil ways in order to save his life. That wicked person will die for his sin, and I will hold you accountable for his blood. Yikes. But then he also says, but if you do warn the wicked man, and he does not turn from his wickedness or from his evil ways, he will die for his sin but you will save yourself. Now listen to a further, he goes on. When a righteous man turns from his righteousness and does evil, and I put a stumbling block before him, he will die. Since you did not warn him, he will die for his sin. The righteous things he did will not be remembered, and I will hold you accountable for his blood. But... If you do warn the righteous man not to sin, and he does not sin, he will surely live because he took warning, and you will have saved yourself. 
See, we have to listen to what God says, and then we have to speak it out. We can't hold that word in because then we become accountable. We'll be held accountable for not sharing that word, for not forth telling what God told us. Now, before we do that, listen, when, when God's word comes to us, we need to use that word to look at our own lives first. Listen to what Jesus says in, in Matthew chapter 7. Do not judge or you too will be judged. And so it's not our place to judge. We're not the judge. We just simply speak what God's going to say to us, like Ezekiel said, or God said to Ezekiel, hear the words that I'm saying and then speak them. Now Jesus goes on, for in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So here's what we do instead. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, Jesus says. First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the the speck from your brother's eye. So in other words, when we hear God's word, when he speaks and he says, I am foretelling the judgment that will come for this evil behavior. I am forth telling how you are not measuring up to the righteous standard. We have a responsibility to share that with other people, but we have a responsibility first to make sure that the Holy Spirit isn't speaking that word to us because we have a plank that we have to take out of our own eye. But did you hear what Jesus said? After you have done that, after you have dealt with it yourself, then you can go and share that word with other people. We forth tell then. And you know what? Your own response to the word can become an incredible testimony. You can say, hey, look, I was reading this in the Bible, and boy, did the Holy Spirit convict me of a plank in my eye. And I was remorseful over that, but I asked forgiveness, and now I'm rejoicing that that forgiven sin has been trampled under God's foot and thrown into the depths of the ocean. I don't have that plank there anymore, and that's allowed me to see more clearly that there might be a little speck in your eye, just a little bit of what I was experiencing in a big way. I see a little bit of that in you. And friend, you can experience the same relief that I experienced If you'll recognize the speck in your eye and you'll respond to God appropriately, you'll ask for forgiveness of that sin. God will deal with that in your life. It has to start with us. But we also have to remember, just like we saw in Nahum where God said, I am against you. He wasn't against the people. He was against that spirit of prostitution that that was coming against the people. It's the same thing. When we are foretelling and forthtelling, we have to remember we're, we're not in warfare against people. We're not in warfare against people. Paul said to us in Ephesians chapter 6, he said, Our struggle is not, is not against flesh and blood. It's not against people. It's not against your brothers and sisters. But, he says, it's against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. That's exactly what God said in Nahum chapter 3. That spirit of the harlot, that spirit of prostitution, that spirit that has led you away, God says, that's what I'm against. I love people. And so then, Paul goes on in these next verses in Ephesians 6 to tell us we are fighting a spiritual battle. So we need to put on all the armor that God has given us, and then we need to be in prayer. But then Paul closes this section by saying, pray for me also, that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me that I may fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Well, see, after God has spoken to us and we have dealt with the plank in our own eye, and then we recognize I'm not dealing with a flesh and blood person that is around me. I'm dealing with the spirit behind them, and I'm going to wear all the spiritual armor, but then I need prayer that I'm going to fearlessly and lovingly speak the truth. I'm going to forth tell the truth that comes. And then one more passage that I want to share with you 
from the second to the last book of the Bible, the book of Jude. This is the half-brother of Jesus. He talks about, starting in, in verse number 14, about the judgment that is coming, that it has been prophesied as far back as Enoch uh, in the family line of, of, of Adam, right there at the beginning of time, that he's been prophesying. He's been foretelling that judgment is going to come. And he also says, and then there's a bunch of scoffers that are saying, no, nope, no, nope, it's not true. It's not going to happen. But then here's what Jude's counsel is to us as Christians. He says, but you, dear friends, build yourselves up in your most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit, because this is a spiritual warfare. Keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you into eternal life. Okay, Because of his mercy, I don't have to fear judgment anymore, but I can rejoice in the forgiveness of my sins. But now what do we do with that? He says, now take that mercy that you know about. And he says, be merciful to those who doubt, snatch others from the fire and save them. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. Listen, Nahum makes it clear, and, and it is true. Foretelling judgment that is coming on sin is a burden. But forth telling about the escape from judgment, about the redemption, about the forgiveness that Jesus paid for, that's a joy. And friends, you and I need to live in that tension of carrying around a joyful burden. It's not an either or, it's a both and. It's a both and. There is a burden that we have to foretell judgment for sin. But there is a joy that we get to foretell the way that people can escape that judgment through the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. That when they place their faith in him, that there's forgiveness of their sins. This message in Nahum is a message for you and I. Think about this. Nahum the Elkishite. We don't even know where Elkosh was. We don't know anything about Nahum. We don't know his family line. He was just a guy. And he's speaking out against the most powerful nation on the world. Uh, friends, this, this isn't a David and Goliath. This is it's more lopsided than that. This is more like an ant and Goliath. And yet, who was proved correct? God was through these words that he laid on Nahum's heart to share. You may look around you and say, this world is so evil what can I, one person, do? Friends, you can do so much. You can hear the word God speaks. You can look at your own life, deal with any of the planks in your eye, get those sins forgiven, repent of those. Don't fight against people, but on your knees, fight against the spiritual darkness that's holding people in blindness and, and holding them captive, and speak the truth in love. Foretell. Yes, it's a burden. Fourth tell, that's the joy. Live in that joyful burden that you can speak into other people's lives and you can save somebody. Listen to what James says. Remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save him from death and cover over a multitude of sins. Hallelujah. That's what you and I have the joyful burden of being able to do. Father, I pray that you would help my friends that know you as their Savior to realize the joyful burden that you have laid on their life. It's a burden for us to foretell judgment that's coming. It's a joy for us to foretell the means of salvation from that judgment. Help us to always live in that tension. I pray as well for any that are watching this video that don't have a relationship with you, that the words that I have shared with them today would speak to their heart and they would cry out to you. Friend, if that's you, you can pray a simple prayer like this. God, I recognize that my sin has separated me from you and that I'm liable for your judgment. You would be just in letting your judgment fall on me. But instead, your judgment fell on Jesus when he died on that cross and he paid the penalty for my sins. And so by faith, I place 
my faith in Jesus, and I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Give me a brand new beginning, a brand new start. Thank you, Lord. Amen. God bless you, friends. I love hearing from you. You can comment in the questions be- in the comments section below. There's a lot of other ways for you to get in touch with me. I'd love to be able to interact with you. I'm praying for you. I love you. Live in that burden, that joyful burden of knowing what God has called you to do. God bless you.